Hello and welcome to the Global Networking Show. It's a new monthly show in which Ivan Meisner and I will dis discuss key topics covering all areas of networking with a host of guests from around the world. I'm Andy Lepato, I'm a business networking strategist and I'm the author of three books on networking. And hello, I'm Dr. Ivan Meisner. I'm the founder and chairman of BNI, which is uh, the world's largest business networking organization, also the founder of the Referral Institute, a, a training company throughout the world. Uh, I've authored a number of books on networking, and I want to thank Andy for inviting me to co-host of the show. Uh, this was uh, Andy's idea. I think it's a brilliant idea. And uh, Andy, I appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to co-host it with you. Um, each month we plan to address uh, key issues that affect business people looking in their organizations to develop uh, their career or to build referrals through networking. We want to cover topics like uh, how people network differently across the globe. And we want to explore the power of social networking sites and discuss how men and women uh, approach networking and how that's different. Andy? Well, you can watch the show uh, on YouTube and Google Hangouts, uh, as well as subscribing to the podcast on iTunes. Uh, at the moment, uh, it will initially be on my Google Hangout page and my YouTube channel, both Andy Lapata. Uh, but as we're established, they'll go direct to the Global Networking Show channels. Uh, you can also interact with us. This first show isn't interacted live, um, but please do still send us questions on the hashtag on Twitter, GN Show, as in Global Networking Show. Uh, and for future shows, we'll actually hope to have some uh, Twitter input uh, live on the show. Today, we're going to start with a controversial topic that also always generates strong opinions, and that's how big should your network be? There's a large group of people typified by lions, LinkedIn open networkers, who believe that the broader your network, the better positioned you are to benefit from your connections. LinkedIn open networkers focus on the power of six degrees of separation, and that's the idea that you're connected to anyone in the world uh, through no more than five steps. And so they believe that a wide network will help you connect to anyone that you want to meet. And Andy, one of these days I want to talk about the six degrees of separation because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not true, and I'd love to talk about that. Uh, the very research itself, uh, the researcher uh, never used that expression, so that'd make a great show someday. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people argue that connections really lack meaning if there's no strong relationship, and that you've really got to have a strong relationship if you want to give a recommendation for people uh, to do business. It's really about building trust. And I'm sure that we can uh, we can talk about six degrees both on on this show and maybe a future one as well, because uh, I'm probably with you uh, on that to a certain degree, Ivan. Um, but we've, it's not just Ivan and I um, today. We've we've been joined by two guests to to explore different approaches in in, in a bit more detail. Um, our first guest, uh, together with his wife Penny, made his name as the co-founder and chairman of the UK-based social networking site eacademy.com. Now that was founded in 1998, so really was one of the first social networking sites used for business, truly focusing on, on connections for business people all over the world, and it predates LinkedIn uh, by some five years. Um, Thomas Power and, and Penny Power sold Academy a couple of years ago, um, and Thomas now speaks and consults about social networking, as well as describing himself as a matchmaker and holding down a number of non-executive directorships. Now, Thomas also holds the world record for the number of testimonials on his LinkedIn profile, so you might guess which camp he sits in. And uh, Thomas, it's great to see you again. Uh, Thomas was our first guest. Uh, I'm at my lake house. Uh, he and his family were our first guest here, and it's great to see you again, Thomas. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of introducing Max uh, Stain. Uh, Max uh, actually won an award for his master's thesis, which we're going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, he has been the CEO of a company that uh, turns recycled paper, paper into uh, usable educational uh, products. Uh, he has a lovely girlfriend and a cat. We got to talk about the cat thing, though, Max. Uh, he's got an amazing research study that I absolutely love. 
And it's great for Max to join us. And, and, and this truly, you know, we've called this the Global Networking Show because the goal is to get experiences and opinions and different approaches to networking from all over the world. So we start with two guys from the UK today, uh, with Thomas joining us, uh, as well as me. We've got uh, Ivan from the States, and Max is joining us from Sweden. And as we go through the shows, we'll have people from, from all continents, maybe not Antarctica, um, but otherwise I think we'll have everything covered. Although, is there a BNI in Antarctica, Ivan? Not yet, no. Not yet. <laughs> I knew it would be not yet. Um, so anyway, so on with the guests we have today. Thomas, I want to start with you. Many years ago, I don't know if you recall this, but we spoke together at a series of events around England and Scotland, built as the art and the science of networking. And I talked about the art of networking, the skills involved, the relationship building processes there. And I always remember you standing up at those sessions with your notebook in hand and quoting figures. You talked about the science behind it and you talked about how many meetings you needed in order to earn a certain amount of turnover for your business in a year. Um, so there was a very, very different approach which worked quite well in terms of, of the events that we ran. Do you still um, go by the same type of maths? Can you outline you know, what the approach was? How maybe, I mean, we're talking about 10 years ago, so how maybe the approach has changed over the years? And you know, what the scientific approach is to the way you network? Thanks, Andy. Nice to see you all, Max and uh, Ivan. Thank you for welcoming me on the show. Yes, it's fair to say I'm still completely obsessed with the numbers, Andy. I'm totally obsessed and still discovering how to make them work more and more and more. Um, going back to uh, Ivan even doubting Stanley Milgram's 1967 PhD of uh, six degrees of separation, if you read the PhD about Twitter, the actual number of de degrees of separation is four now. The impact of Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn, Academy, Google+, has reduced the number of connections around the world to anybody in the world to just four. It's just under four, actually. It's about 3.87. So Stanley's 96, uh, 1967 PhD has been updated. I do hold the world record for the number of uh, connections and uh, testimonials on LinkedIn. I've held it for 10 years. But uh, my bigger claim to fame is on January the 14th, 2004, I've got the only testimonial from Sean Parker. Now, for those of you who may remember Sean Parker, Napster, Facebook, Spotify, Plaxo. Um, so I still like my one testimonial from Sean because he's only written one on LinkedIn and I've got it. Um, can, I just, can I just ask you something there, Thomas? Because that begs a question. Is there more value in having more testimonials than anyone else or in having the right people saying the right things about you? I'd always still believe in more. Um, I still only believe in uh, in volume. I have huge respect for what Ivan has achieved the last uh, 25, 30 years with uh, with BNI. Massive, massive respect because I always consider him the father of networking. But in terms of in terms of scale and size, I do believe in Dunbar's number about the fact that uh, the, the number of intimate relationships you can hold in your head is somewhere between 100 and 230 from Robin Dunbar's uh, paper. Up in, uh, up in Cambridge University. But I also think there's something else going on that we can't understand, and that's the random connections. The, th the connections that you don't know are happening as a result of just observations around you. And I use every type of uh, plug-in, email system, analysis tool, li literally dozens of them plugged into my Chrome browser. I probably have three dozen different things that are analyzing every email I receive, everything I send, everything I ship to spam. Uh, every time someone opens one of my emails, I know when Ivan opens my emails, how long he looks at my emails, when he closes them, when he reopens them. And he doesn't even know I'm even watching him do that. And the scary thing is I could even phone him while he's opening them to upset him. But I do believe there's something between... Um, the LinkedIn network, the Facebook network, the Twitter network, the Google Plus network, the Instagram network that we haven't yet discovered, that there's a whole series of um, random connections operating on a much, a much higher level. Um, somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 connections, I suspect, can connect you to everybody in the whole world. 
It's just figuring out how to manage the data. And as I say, I've tried every application on the web. And there isn't a piece of software yet that can actually manage the amount of contacts that I have to deal with. I've got 68,000 contacts in my Zobni file. But I can't run that file through Gmail. I can't run it through Outlook. I can't run it through Facebook. I can't run it through LinkedIn. I can't run it through Plexo. I can't run my data file of contacts. I've had uh, half a million emails in the last uh, five years, about 100,000 a year. I can't find any system for managing the number of interactions that I have around the world. So I still believe in volume, I still believe in the random connections, but I can't find a model or a system that can manage the data set yet, Andy. Okay, well, I mean, I, I know what a lot of the people I talk to will be thinking uh, as you talk through that, and it was very interesting to hear, uh, you know, a completely different approach. And, and actually, I think it will be interesting in, in a moment to hear Ivan's perspective on this as well, because you're talking to someone whose whole business is built on face-to-face -face relationships uh, a, a compared to someone who's purely talking technology. Uh, a few years ago... Oh, I Andy, you... Andy, Andy, I can't let you get away with that. I, I do have a thousand <laughs> meetings a year face-to-face. -face. Okay, so, so let's come back into that then because that leads to the question. Um, a few years ago I interviewed Carol Stone, who's known as the Queen of Networking in London, and, and yes. Carol's known for having hu a huge network, as you know. Mm. And I asked her how many people she had in her database. She said 20,000. And I said, well, how many of those do you know? And she said about 10,000 of them, which I thought was quite an impressive response. And I felt that I set my goal at the time as not meeting Carol or exchanging business cards or being invited to one of her famous salons or parties. It was about when Carol saw me and knew exactly who I was and what I did. That's when I felt I was in her network. Now, with the 68,000 contacts you get, with the thousands of meetings a year that you have, how important are the depth of relationships you have? And, and just quickly before you answer that, you talked about the Dunbar number, the, the one, around 150 contacts you can remember. I mean, I think that now, particularly with the technology that you've talked about, it's not a flat number. A network isn't a flat entity that you have layers of networks. So there are the people who I know very well. I, c I can call you guys or you can call me and we each know each other at the end of the phone because certainly with Ivan and Thomas, we all, we've all known each other for a number of years. Um, but there are other people. Max and I have just interacted for the first time this month because Ivan's introduced us. So it, it would take longer to get to that point, and I think Max can come in later with some of his research on intimacy, which 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 reflects this. But I'm asking a very long question here, so Thomas, how do you get that balance between building relationships and relying on numbers and technology? And then I want to jump in and say something after Thomas replies, if it's all right. Okay, so in terms of your question about the depth of relationship, I like to think I have a deep relationship with Ivan. Ivan says, inviting your 750. I like that's there's my email talking to me. Um, I like to think I have a deep, intimate relationship with Ivan and Beth, and I like to think I have the same with uh, Andy because of the amount of time that we've spent together talking over the years. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to be interacting on the phone or email or Skype or Facebook or Twitter, you know, every week to maintain that level of intimacy because we've served our hours together. I think if you look at the number of people that you actually meet in your career, I've been working for 30 years, I find most people meet between 200 and 1,000 people in a year, both professionally and socially. So in a career running to uh, 50 years or probably even 60 years in uh, Ivan's case, they may have met between 10 and 20,000 people in your whole career. And you may have had one or two hours with those people. Now, the, the amount of depth of relationship depends on the intimacy of the engagement of when you were with that person. In other words, did you hit it off? Did you get on? So I, I would say it's quite possible for Carol to actually know 10,000 people in London. And having been to a party, one of her Christmas parties that are quite famous, which typically attract about 1,500 people, I've stood on the, uh, on the Grosvenor Hotel steps with Carol and watched her first name 1500 people through that door and to me that was it was mind-blowing to watch her greet 1500 people through the door of her party at Christmas and actually name the first time because that's ten times Robin Dunbar's number 
And I think Carol probably does remember 10,000 people in her head because she's probably had at least an hour with those 10 or 20,000 people in her lifetime. But what Robin's saying is you can't maintain more than a bit between 100 and 150 people of intimate names and numbers in your head. I'm not trying to maintain 100, 150 numbers in my head. I'm trying to maintain 50,000 people in my head uh, supported by computers. I'm trying to have the largest number of relationships as possible to have in the world and be able to say, oh, I think I know you through. Um, the other, the other uh, trick I've learnt when I meet people is I say to them, when I meet them, I might say to Max or Ivan or, or Andy, I might say, have we met before? And then people start to wonder, have we met before, to see if there's another connection that they may have met through somebody else. So I do think it's possible for humans to maintain thousands of relationships. We just can't prove it yet through any scientific mechanism. And I think most of what's in Dunbar's number is a load of baloney, but I'm happy to, to, to accept that he's a mathematician at Cambridge with a first-class degree, and I'm not, so therefore I have to uh, respect his PhD. But I don't believe a word of it, quite frankly. <laughs> Ironically, I, I do believe the Dunbar number. I think it's uh, probably a fairly accurate number, and I don't believe Milgram's number. You mentioned that it was his PhD dissertation. It was actually several studies that Milgram did. He never used the term six degrees. That was the media that used the term. And here's where it, uh, it falls apart. He found he, he basically needed to get a packet of material to some guy in Boston, and he gave it to people, I think, in Kansas City. And he found that it took about six steps to get to that person in Boston. So far, so good. Here's the problem. Only 29% of the participants ever got the packet through. That's it. The other 71% not only couldn't find the guy, they couldn't find their car keys. They were lost. So only one out of three people were separated by six degrees. And that, by the way, was his best study. Uh, his worst study found that it was one out of about a dozen people. So that in and of itself is not a problem. There, I believe many of us are connected by six degrees, but not everyone. The other thing with LinkedIn, the math doesn't work, and here's why. Here's the problem with it being four degrees in LinkedIn. Do you, obviously, Thomas, you know people I know. There are, there's at least one out of the four people here that you know. I don't know if you know Max. So the math doesn't work because um, what happens is I know many of the people you know, you know many of the people I know, and when you start to do the mathematics of it, you're, you're double counting people, and therein lies the fallacy in the, in the math of LinkedIn. All of that said, I still think it's powerful to have a broad network. So from that sense, you and I agree. Where we disagree is I think people rely on that. They think I've got a big network, therefore I'm a successful networker. I believe that if your network is a mile wide and an inch deep, you are not a good networker. That your network needs to be both wide and deep, and I think that's part of what Max found to some extent in his survey and I think we or in his work and I think we should introduce Max if, if you're good with that Andy. Yeah absolutely I mean I was actually going to ask Max to come in on something that Thomas said as well. well go ahead. Uh, Thomas is itching to get in but you're going to have to hold back a second. <laughs> uh, Max you know I, I think a number of things that both Thomas and Ivan have said relate to, you, to the research that you've done. One of the things and I think it comes to this point about wide versus deep networks and, and lots of meetings against getting to know people is you talked about frequency of contact in, in your paper. And, and you say that relationship studies have shown that relationships that uh, where people don't actively maintain them tend to decay. Um, and you talk about the importance of, of intimacy as well between people. So Ivan's talked about strong and, uh, and weak ties uh, and touched on Granovetter's theory and he's talked about people knowing all the same people. Actually, I haven't I haven't talked about that yet. So but you talked I, about um, I talked about Milgram. Let me just mention Granovetter. <clears throat> the, the, the work that uh, Max did was on Granovetter's uh, uh, concept of the strength of weak ties. And I've had debates with people who said to me, uh, any networking group where you're meeting people on a regular basis is a total waste of time because Granovetter showed that weak ties are powerful. And the, the, the fallacy in that study is that it was about uh, employment. I agree. When it comes to employment, weak ties are very powerful. But when it comes for me referring somebody for business, boy, I better know them and trust them before I make that referral. And so I disagree. 
I had a chance to meet Max, and Max has a great story that maybe he'll share before we end about how he got connected with me because it was it was about understanding who I am to that enabled him to make that connection with me. But uh, he asked me what research would be a good project to do for a master's thesis, and I said Granovetter's uh, research because I believe the strength of weak ties has almost no application in a in a strong contact network like a BNI or other kinds of networks and Max you found I know you want to jump in Thomas but we gotta let Max speak you you found what Max I found that that is actually true what you're saying that you do get the most referrals from your strong ties I see you nodding there, Thomas. But we have we have the figures to back it up. I, I could agree what you, what you're saying about the frequency in contact. That if you have a strong relationship, you might not have to talk to people all the time. In fact, our research showed that frequency in contact may not have all that major impact on how many referrals you get. But it is important, only to a minor extent. But as Ivan said about trust, I think that's one of the the major things that impact uh, how many referrals you do get. And Max, you found that the people who have weak ties uh, passed, and this statistic to me is amazing. And by the way, Milgram uh, surveyed 68 people. <laughs> Your survey was uh, 1,100 people, a statistically significant number. You found that people who had weak ties had what number of referrals? Do you recall offhand? Uh, I could look it up. It was point point four. Point four, yeah. Point four. Yeah, and, and people who had strong ties, what was their number? Do you recall that? That was I do. seven point four. Seven in, a, point four. in a year. Yeah, so point four referrals in a year for people who had weak uh, uh, a weak connection, and seven point four uh, for people who had a strong connection. Uh, that's a, a 1800 percent difference something like that it's an amazing percentage yeah there was also a significant difference in the value of these referrals oh okay. and that Talk is about that. well basically yeah there there is a difference in the value and I could see that coming as if you really know someone and you care about them honestly you would go above and beyond to refer that person if you don't know them well, you don't have the the same incentives to uh, to refer them emotionally. That is, I, I think that's a really important point because where I I struggle with the the, the lion philosophy that I talked about earlier is this concept that the more connections you've got, the more referrals that you'll get because you'll be connected to the right people. Because for me, where's the motivation to refer? You know, if I'm connected to you but I don't know you, and I ask you to introduce me to someone that you don't know how much faith will they have in your referral uh, and your word and, and how much motivation will you have to put me forward so I think that you lose a lot of uh, currency there before Thomas comes in before his head explodes which I can see happening um, just a reminder that, that we have a hashtag that if you've got any thoughts on this or you've got any questions to ask which is hashtag GN show global networking show so please keep the debate going discussion going after seeing uh, the broadcast so Thomas challenge Max Okay, well, for, I want to challenge Max and uh, Ivan because all their logic is based on the concept that you would be seeking referrals. Okay, I am not seeking referrals. I do not seek referrals. I do not seek business. I do not seek to be introduced to get opportunities and transactions. That's not why I build networks. That's, I don't have any motive associated with that. So I think in the context of seeking referrals, I have to I have to trust Max's numbers are right based on 7.4 and 0.4. But where Ivan's uh, mile wide, uh, inch deep argument falls apart for him in front of his own face, in front of his own fantastic network, is the fact that how many of the 150,000 do you know personally, Ivan? 
Uh, I would say I have met over the, my career probably forty to fifty thousand of them, but that's I'm not the one getting referrals from them. Okay, but you've met forty to fifty thousand. How many of those forty to fifty thousand would you say you know intimately? Uh, in the low thousands, one thousand, maybe two thousand. One or two thousand. I would say intimately. Yeah, absolutely. And into that into that category, would I fit myself? Absolutely. And would Max? You, stay, fit you stayed at my house. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, it could have been a bad stay. <laughs> well, I know you intimately. But would you say would you say Max fits into uh, the intimate one or two thousand as well? Yeah, and Max is close. In my VCP process, I would say he's a credibility with me. So, um, uh, yeah, he probably would because I certainly know who he is and what he does, uh, but I don't know him really well. So something less than the relationship that I have with you. Can you okay. just explain the VCP process for people that don't know it, Ivan? Uh, VCP stands for Visibility, Credibility, Profitability. It's a chronological process. It's the foundation of everything I teach. Uh, you must first be visible in the community. People have to know who you are and what you do. Then you have to establish credibility. That's where people know who you are, they know what you do, and they know you're good at it. That's definitely where I'm at with Max. Profitability is where you, people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're good at it, and they support each other in some way. It may be through referrals, it may be through... Uh, assistance, uh, Thomas and I, although we haven't really done referrals, we've helped each other in various ways. So we're we're at profitability, at least in my mind, we're at profitability. Max and I are probably about that close from it because we're going to start to do some writing together. Uh, and that's how I would gauge the two. So if you're talking about intimate being people that you're even at credibility with, I would make that number higher, 5,000 maybe. Okay, so if there's 5,000 intimate relationships, and many of the people are your country leaders that you don't necessarily know have been referred to you by me, Ivan, because you know I'm not counting them and you're not counting them. But in the case of Max, what would you say, what would you both say my relationship with Max is? Am I a weak tie or am I a strong tie? Well, I think Max has to answer that. Max, are, are, um, are you a weak tie or a strong tie? To you? I would say a weak tie because I... I uh, just met you, not personally, but online. So okay. in my in my process, it would be a, you're you're just now at visibility. Okay, but yeah. would it would it be fair to say that as a result of being on this uh, video conference, TV show, whatever it's called, that uh, we're moving up from weak to strong in view of the emails we've exchanged during the week as well to get to know each other? We're not as strong yet. I would I wouldn't say, but I. I definitely have checked out some things that you do, and I respect you, and I trust you. But if we were to if we were to meet in Sweden or Ivan's house or Andy's house, it'd be fair to say with an hour of meeting, we would be strong ties, right? It could be because of the introduction by Ivan and Andy. Ivan and Andy are ensuring that you and I become strong ties overnight, even if it's only a global Skype conference. Well. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know until afterwards, so we, are, we, we have to do it and get back. Now the, the, <laughs> floor, show on this, but. the floor in Ivan's argument is that he's, he has 150,000 people in his network, which is uh, unbelievable in, in 25, 30 years. He's met 40 or 50,000 of them. He has an intimate relationship, he thinks, with somewhere between one and 10,000, depending on how he describes the level through the VCP process. But the bit he's not allowing for is the remaining 110,000 who he hasn't met who think they know him intimately because they've been in a room with him, uh, they've been in a chat group with him, they've been at a bar with him, they've been in a restaurant with him, but they may not have got a chance to speak and they're not necessarily weak ties. I would actually go as far as to say Ivan probably has 150,000 strong ties which breaks all the models possible in the world of anybody's level of intimacy management. And his biggest issue will be how does he maintain a dialogue with 150,000 people, be it Skype or Twitter or LinkedIn. And it's impossible now for Ivan to manage that community as it was for Penny and I to manage 600,000 people in Academy. But the 600,000 people in Academy thought they knew us. Thomas, here's, here's where I disagree. Because uh, I, I said to you, I, I believe I'm at profitability with you. But the truth is I would not be at profitability. If, if you said 
well, and you don't you don't have to throw me under the bus, but if you said, um, yeah, I'm really not at profitability. I'm really more at credibility. The truth is, we're at credibility because you're at you're at whoever's at the lowest. So I may have 150,000 people who think that they're at profitability with me because they would refer me. It's not reciprocal. I would not necessarily refer them unless I knew them. So in order for the referral process, and granted, I'm talking about referrals in networking, it's got to be a reciprocal process. One last thing. I'm not opposed to numbers. I think having a lot of contacts is important. As a matter of fact, I wrote about it recently in our newsletter. I call it the squared connection effect. If 16 people have a relationship, you have 256 connections. But if you have 32 people with a, with relationships, you've got 1,024 connections. So the number of people you're connected with is valuable. I just don't think it's either or. I believe it's both and. You've got to have a broad set of connections, and they have to have a deep level of connections. And I think that's what Max discovered in his research. What if it's well, both Mr. and Thomas, then it's weak and strong? Th Thomas, can I just come in on this? Because I think that both of you have got a fair point. Um, where I would I would answer your question is that, you know, I, in a lot of my talks I talk about changing the turning the, the common phrase around you know it's not what you know it's who you know and that's where a lot of the the mass connecting is based on it's not what you know it's who you know if I if, a, if I give out a lot of business cards if I collect a lot of business cards if I connect with as many people as possible online I've got a good network but if those people aren't thinking about you at the right time if they don't recognize the opportunities for you whether it's referral whether it's advice, whether it's just talking about you, whether it's spotting an opportunity, whatever it may be, then there's not much value in that that connection. So I believe it's not what you know or who you know, it's who knows you and what they know about you, what they say about you. So say Ivan has 150,000 people who know him. That doesn't mean they're thinking about him all the time. That doesn't mean they know exactly what he's looking for in terms of support, referrals, recommendations, ideas, feedback, market knowledge, whatever it may be. It's only by getting to talk to them on a regular basis, by staying insight in mind, that the right support can help or he can be in a position to prompt that. And I think that's where the, the balance of really strong networking lies. You do yeah, need a broad, diverse network, but you need relationships and constant contact with each other as well. And, I, and let's let Max weigh in here. <laughs> Hang on a second, Thomas. Let's let Max weigh in here because he hasn't had a chance to talk very much. What are, what are your thoughts, Max? And then, Thomas, we really would love to hear more from you. <laughs> I think Andy had, a, Andy had a great point there. So uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested in hearing what, what Thomas has to say here, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back, back in. So Thomas, go ahead. If if Ivan has 150,000 people in his network, it's probably it's actually 160 now, Thomas. Just so you okay, 160. 10,000 have just joined on this call, and we've only <laughs> been on here 27 minutes. 160,000 is the actual number he can count of uh, memberships or subscriptions or subscribers, or however the model is uh, is verified. But the number of people that know Ivan Meisner will be 10 times that number. It will be in the order of 1.6 million people will know of, have heard of, refer to, have read a book of, seen a video of, watched a Facebook tweet of, seen him on the island with Beth with Richard Branson of, and that number will be 10 times the 160,000. And those, and those 1.6 million will be giving Ivan Meisner referrals. They'll be giving B&I referrals. They'll be recommending his videos, his books, his tapes. And they're completely out of Ivan's ability to control, communicate with, refer, trust, based on the argument that you're, you're, you're bringing everything back to referrals. You have to remember, people like me and a lot of people like me, we don't have any motive about referrals. The thought of referrals, it doesn't even enter my head. I have I don't even think of referrals. I never consider it. I'm Thomas, only well, correct in discovering how networks work. Thomas, just quickly, because I, I, I try to be at pains to say whatever support it may be. So I talk about us networking to become better known, better equipped, or better connected. The latter might would include referrals, but it's support, it's market knowledge, it's ideas. That might be what you're looking for. 
So and, and I would, I would call school. you on the I would call you on the referral thing, Thomas, because uh, when you founded Academy, you and I spoke many times about me referring people to Academy, which I was happy to do. So what you and I may I think we're talking about very much the same thing, but maybe using a different word because you absolutely connected with me, and we had multiple conversations about me referring people over to Academy. But I still think the Ivan Meisner network, like the Thomas Power network, runs into the millions. And the issue is we haven't found a way to manage it. And to say we have 150 intimate relationships or 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or 65 or 40, to me is irrelevant. It's probably that uh, Ivan, Andy, you're probably known by uh, tens of thousands of people. Max, I'm unsure of where you are in the cycle. but. For Penny and I, we, we know it runs into seven figures, the people who are aware of us. And we have no way of managing that. I mean, we can tweet things and blog things and put things on LinkedIn and put videos on YouTube and Instagram and all the various wonderful toys that the kids, the kid geeks of Silicon Valley have created for us. But they haven't created any, any way of us managing our audience. No, no way at all of managing it on a massive scale. So. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the measures are artificial, and to link something back to referrals to me is it's making it too simple. It's looking for a measure. It, it's Ivan reaching out for an olive branch that he hopes is there to prove his model, and he can reach for it and touch it and count it and measure it at 7.4. But it doesn't interest me the referral level. What interests me is, you know, one or two million people know Ivan Meisner. He has absolutely no way at all of managing that network and following that well, are we, interested in him. We agree there that it's very difficult to manage a large network. But uh, although I may have a very small uh, form of, uh, of celebrity or people know me, the average business person isn't in that situation. And so the kind of research that I like to see done is not for the Ivan Meisners and Thomas Powers and Andy Lapatas and the future you know, knowledge that people are going to have of Max, but for the average Joe, the average business person. And for the average business person, this kind of data is really important because it flies in the face of, of, of Granovator's, Granovator's uh, whole idea that it's all about weak ties, when in fact, I would argue it's also about strong ties, not just weak ties, but also strong ties. And that's where Max's work is, in my mind, brilliant. Can I, uh, can I flip into an event that's forthcoming that's going to screw up the, uh, the thinking about networks? And that is Amazon launching their smartphone uh, sometime between now and the new year for $79. Uh, 50 pounds in real money, Ivan. But a new smartphone from, uh, from uh, Amazon based on, uh, based on the Google Android operating system that they've stripped down a bit that allows you to do things like make phone calls, answer email, and maybe post a Facebook update or a tweet. And this is a phone that will have no... Uh, no other charges, no contracts, no pay-as-you-go. It's 79 bucks. It's a free phone. It's almost a free phone. And Amazon will make their money from selling their usual stuff and uh, music and books and the rest of their catalog. Now, organizations like Verizon and AT&T and Vodafone and China Telecom and uh, O2, you know, probably with 100, 200 million customers each, giant networks are under threat. And they, their organizations that can manage networks, can manage relationships, and can, and can bill hundreds of millions of people a month. And they're about to get killed by somebody coming into the market with a new model. And they, they're able to manage a network of, uh, of fans and payers and customers. So doesn't that just change the whole dynamic about the whole of networks? If you look at you know what Ivan said about not being about Thomas Powers, not being about the the, the Ivan Misers, the Andy Lapartas, not about Veri Verizon or AT and T or British Telecom, whoever it may be, I don't see other than more accessibility to online networking how that's going to be relevant to the small business owner, to the uh, person networking for their career within a large or smaller organization or within an industry. I don't see where that's going to be relevant to them, Thomas. Well, look, say, say Ivan decides to get his 160,000 people from BNI, he puts it in a little app, 
and he, he puts it on the uh, he puts it on the new Amazon phone, and you can download the BNI network onto your new free Amazon phone, and you can suddenly all have 160,000 connections connected into your LinkedIn and your Twitter and your Facebook and your Google Plus and your Instagram, because Ivan's decided to make his his network available, and you can say and Ivan can say you can trust my network. They're members of BNI. Uh, they've all been trained by me and my system and my franchise. You can believe in me, uh, Ivan Mice, and you can believe in my network. Download your 160,000 network straight onto your free Amazon phone, and boom, you too can have 160,000 trusted business contacts around the world. Surely that changes the whole dynamics of, uh, of networks. Yeah, yeah but Andy's from? point is still valid. And not everybody has that network of 160,000 people. We're talking about the average person. And I'd really like to see Max have an opportunity to jump in with any of his findings from his research. Yeah, I just first want to say, correct me if I'm wrong, Ivan, but you can actually reach all the 160,000 BNI members through BNI Connect. I can, yes. And, and they can reach each other, but not all of each other, so they have to connect there. And the whole idea of uh, putting out 160,000 names uh, falls apart when you start talking about uh, Data Protection Act regulations that exist in all of the countries. So I get the concept of what you're talking about, but the reality would is it would actually be illegal. But yeah. go ahead. And there's not many referrals being passed there, as I've heard of. There are some brilliant ones, but number-wise, it's not even close. No, no, it's not, and it will never replace the face-to-face -face for our program. However, there are more and more taking place online, and it's happening when people are getting to know each other in the online venue. So I'm a believer in online networking, or I wouldn't have invested in BNI Connect. But again, to me, it's either or, not both. Uh, it's, e it's not either or, it's both. Uh, both are important. So I don't disagree with Thomas, but I think it's much more than just what Thomas is saying. Max, in terms of what Thomas was suggesting, you know, can you perhaps talk a little bit about what the research found in terms of the importance of people seeing each other, the importance of uh, constant contact, and, and maybe where the balance would be between online networking and seeing each other face to face? Yeah, online networking is one part of uh, frequency of contact. So you can maintain uh, a relationship through online uh, contact and through face-to-face -face contact. So both those add up into the frequency in contact. It did show that frequency in contact maybe not get you referrals. It helps to build uh, the relationship, but it's not getting all that referrals. So what's the extra edge? What do you need to add to it? I'm not sure actually, because we we had we measured four different items that add, adds up to a, a relationship, and that was one of those indicators of tie strength. That was frequency and contact. That was one of them. It was closeness. It was intimacy and reciprocity. And none of this, uh, these indicators show any major impact on the number of referrals. However, they were really indicative of the the tie strength. And did you discover, you, you said in the research discovered that there were seven referrals per year, I think Ivan said 7.4 per year, on, a, on a, a strong tied network. Did you define the size of a strong close-knit network? Come again? Did you, did, I think Ivan said there were 7.4 referrals per year for a close-knit uh, strong contact network, I think Andy used to refer to those as. How were you defining the size of a strong contacts network? Uh, we were defining the ties as when you answered the uh, the survey, you answered from one point to seven points, and between five and seven were a strong tie. And that's an ob observation we made because we we made a lot of interviews with the NI members, and we all had uh, a lot of observations to uh, to really narrow down what. A strong tie was in the the BNI sense. One to seven is a Likert scale, commonly used in uh, uh, professional research. I'm not sure I understand how big a network you're saying efficiently delivers seven referrals a year. Is that is that 50 people, 100 people, 30 people? That's the bit. What's that, the network size that delivers that referral rate range? That's where that's within every BNI chapter. 
So, so you're, you're looking at about approximately a hole four, in the whole theory. You're looking at approximately 24 people in his research. That would be the statistical mean globally, uh, and seven is the statistical mean in his data. So, you know, there, it could have been three times that. It could have been zero. So the average was a seven out of a group of about two dozen. So you're saying if the statistical mean was 24, then the average, the in a group size of a close network of 24 people as an average, they typically give each other seven referrals per annum, 24 among 24 people. Well, those would be here's here's where it could and Max should answer this, but um, this is where people said they had a close relationship with the other 24. So only those people of the 24 who identified that they had a close relationship. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Max. But uh, it would be those people who said they had a close relationship. Or did you count all all of the bodies in the in the group? No, that's correct. Well, yes. then it would be 24 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So the size of the network would be in the 10 to 20,000 range in terms of the number <laughs> of available referrals. Yeah, I like the way you do math. Uh, no, but it was a good try. I, th I think as well there's there's an anomaly here because you're talking about within a, a, a BNI chapter, whereas for other people who are listening to this, they're not members of a formal networking group, but they're still interested on the size of their network, so how many people they know, how many people they interact with, and how deep those relationships are. So I think it's important that we look at the two as, as, as separate things. I, I get it's fantastic that you get seven referrals per year in a network of 24 people. Because that would suggest you'd get 14 in a network of 48 people. Uh, actually, it almost triples uh, when a group doubles its size, and that's the squared connection effect that I was talking about. I think on that point, we I, I, this could go on for another hour or two hours. We knew it was going to be an interesting topic to start the show with. Uh, let's carry on the debate on, on Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag, hashtag GN show, Global Networking Show. Uh, have a glass of champagne with Thomas as well, who's raising it if you can't see it. Um, and uh, yeah, keep keep chatting to us. Um, but thank you very much for, for Thomas and Max. Before we go, um, obviously we've talked a lot about Max, what you've done in terms of the research, Thomas, in, in what you've done in the past, and I touched at the beginning about where you are now because you sold Academy on, it's now Sun Tzu. So wh what are you guys up to now? What's your next step? So Thomas, maybe you want to let us know first. Well, two things. We've uh, we've developed a little test called uh, Leadors that you've all filled in this week. L e a d o r s. dot c o. Uh, just 15 questions that determine how you think and how you behave online. And we've built that up over the last 12 months. Two and a half thousand people have filled that in, and uh, some major accounts are now rolling out Leadors inside their organisations. And what I was trying to do with uh, Leadors with Penny was trying to figure out who are the people who are most suitable to do the networking inside your corporation? And the big discovery was the, the one in eight profiles, the ORS profiles, are the most suitable. So we formed a, a super connectors group um, inside a lot of organizations so those people can work together. And the other big discovery, the big surprise for me, is, is seven out of eight executives in large corporations actually detest networking and detest social media and detest the whole new world. So we just we're not we're not focusing on those, we're just focusing on the one in eight who are open, random and supportive and training those how to be more effective at networking in BNI and all the other executive groups around the world. Excellent. Will you put a link up to leaders on the uh, hashtag on Twitter? I will, yes, thank you. That'll be great. And Max, how about you? Yeah, I, I just uh got out of college here, I graduated and had my master's degree in marketing. And uh, as Ivan said before, I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of a company that turns recycled paper into educational toys and uh, some other usable products. And that's uh, a startup that I'm, I'm working on and I'm looking forward to, to growing. But, uh, Excellent. Well, well, congratulations on the Masters and best of luck with, with the new venture. And, and we'll put up your Twitter address and your details if anyone wants to follow and, uh, and get in touch with any questions as well. That's all from me. Ivan, over to you just to, to close off for today's show. 
Yeah, and th thanks to both Thomas and Max. It was a very lively discussion. I hope all of our shows uh, are this lively. Uh, next month, uh, we're going to be looking at cultural differences when, uh, when you're networking all around the world. In the meantime, everyone, don't forget that you can revisit this discussion on Google+, YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. Please also sign up to the Global Networking Show on Facebook and Twitter, Twitter, and share the show with your uh, friends and business contacts. We hope to see you all next month. Again, Max, uh, Thomas, uh, thank you for being our guests. And Andy, thanks for such a great idea. I'm really happy to participate. Thank you, Max, Ivan, Andy. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next month.